So, my name is Luca and I'm coming from Eternity Blockchain and Eternity Ventures. It's a blockchain uh, 3.0 platform and a venture fund, fund um, connected to it. And the topic of today's presentation, as you all noticed, is a big clickbait. Uh, so, the question is, do blockchain startups, do they mix or they don't mix? Um, and it's actually... Um, I've been observing um, the blockchain space for quite a long time and um, one of the things that I realized and it's not going whoop. so give me a second hey okay so um, as I was saying I was observing the blockchain space for quite a long time and one of the things that I realized that a lot of you know people in the space um, they're building blockchain projects, they think and behave like normal rules of startups and entrepreneurship don't apply to them. So that's basically one of the reasons why I got into the, the space in the first place. I'm coming from the startup and uh, the startup and the investment uh, experience and uh, I'm basically um, the intent of the talk is actually to give an overlay and an overview of um, the main crucial points that every blockchain project, actually every project, but specifically blockchain project, um, needs to do before writing a single line of code, before doing even, you know, heaven forbid, an ICO, STO, IEO, whatever O, you know, is popular right now, uh, in order to not to burn the money and not to uh, screw their investors or the people who invested in them. So um, let's start. But so there are many, many rules, but we're going to cover the main four ones. Because if you follow these main four ones, uh, you're good to go. I mean, still, you're probably going to die in the end, but you're going to die a little bit later uh, <laughs> if you don't do this. But before we start, I would like to reframe the conversation a little bit. And I would like to reframe it just by doing a little bit of uh, kind of a historic overview. How did we start? How did we end up here? And how did we actually start? Where did we start from? So, so I love the beautiful, colorful backgrounds, but this is actually what is happening right now with the current system. So our modern political system that we are living in right now and the rules that we are abiding was born during the Industrial Revolution. So it's basically a couple of hundred years old. So this was a time, for those of you who remember, uh, this was a time of massive organizations, centralized control, consolidation of power, consolidation of everything, and everything was invented for the sake of it. So nation states uh, basically uh, as opposed to tribalism and tribes kind of existed for only 200 years. We take it for, for granted. So the, the, the whole society that we live right now is based on the rules that we built 200 years ago. And of course, we improved it, you know, a lot of, a lot of things throughout the time. But one of the th main things um, that is true right now is that these rules are no, no longer adequate for the current society and the world that we're living right now. And I think everybody here in the room, um, if not agreeing, but you actually feel that at least part of that is not uh, adequate for us. So what is happening right now, uh, currently around us, whether we are um, aware of it or not, is this new revolution. So it is of a same probably magnitude, maybe even of a higher magnitude than the one that we actually just passed now. So 200 years ago, we didn't have anything. We, you know, with the uh, invention of the steam engine, invention of the electricity, invention of all of the things that followed uh, later, um, basically enabled this society, society that is char characterized by endless choice. So right now, if you wanted to, um, you could actually learn anything that is out there in the world. So 200 years ago, that was kind of clusterized and you had gatekeepers who kept this knowledge. Today, this is completely endless choice. 
Digital technology, basically it's all encircling, all encompassing. We, everything around us, majority of the things around us, even if you live in, I don't know, rural Africa is in one form digital. So if you live in, I don't know, the Tohonga village in Kenya, you still use something called Mpesa, which is a banking system, which is a digital system, which replaces cash. So every aspect of our society is somehow digitalized. So data, again, becomes the new norm. So if you, uh, or somebody said it before, that data is the new oil, right? Um, automation. So industrial revolution was the beginning of automation. It freed us from you know, intensive hard labor, which is now happening as a consequence of all of this in all aspects of life. So I don't know, in 10 years, uh, we're probably going to see a lot of things going through the window. A lot of jobs are going to cease to exist, just like, you know, the guys who were turning on the lamps, the gas lamps on the streets are no longer existing. Um, so endless choice, digital technology, data, automation, AI, all of these things, um, are happening right now around us, although we just take them for granted. Why? Because we grew up in this society and it became part of us and we are still not aware that the society that we're living in right now, the rules that we're abiding, were invented 200 years ago. And they're super slow on um, adapting. So this is what's happening as a consequence of all of this. The economy the identity, political systems, political allegiances, even the essence of what is to be a human are changing in all aspects. You can see it. You can agree with it. You can think that it is bad. You, for example, if I um, ask my father, he would say that this is the end of the world. 10 years from now, the humanity is going to cease to exist because we became idiots and all the traditional values that we uphold are no longer you know, true and the whole society is going to fall apart. If, you, uh, if I ask my, I don't know, any of my young friends or my sister, she's now 22 or 24, this is super amazing, exciting in the way that it should be. And um, the whole thing you know, is a dichotomy behind, uh, between the old world and the new world. So the current setup that we're living in right now, it, you know, it will cling for a while. It will not disappear. So this nuclear explosion behind us um, is a metaphorical one. So just like any legacy IT system, it, who of you here is from the IT crowd? Raise your hand just to see. Okay. So you know what's a legacy IT system, right? So this is something ancient and old like fax machines that are still being used, but somebody invested a lot of money, a lot of time and invested a lot of time in school um, and they are still here because it's either too expensive or too inconvenient to replace. So this is exactly you know, what's happening to this society right now, to the governance systems, to everything that we have right now. So it is too expensive to update, but as the time progressed, it will soon become redundant and it will be replaced just by, you know, force of the nature. So uh, the reset is this, that we, again, people in this room, but people all around the world um, are doing this right now. So we are doing a restructuring of our politics, our society, and it is led by technology. And this is, again, something completely inevitable. It started since, you know, we walked the earth as monkeys a uh, long time ago. So this is the, uh, the our, let's say, technology-led revolution and evolution. So I just wanted to re reframe the conversation a little bit away from the startups and just start from the scratch and start from the beginning. Because people actually, uh, when they think about startups, when you think about new ventures, they need to think about how did we start off and how did these things start. So industrial revolution was the most, was the bloody cutting edge of the 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th century. The, you know what was the most innovative industry 100 years ago? The most innovative in industry. Take a guess. Cars, trains, electricity. That was the bleeding edge. They were the Elon Musks and the whoever is now 
Uh, cool. So today, 100 years ago, uh, 100 years later or more, we don't even think about electricity. It is like air that we're breathing right now. Without electricity, the whole civilization collapses. So, but 100 years ago, it didn't exist. It was a quirk. It was a gadget that, you know, you know this thing that you pull off on during Christmas dinner or something like this, and, you know, your father or mother complains, lah, you know. Again, with these smart watches and these, you know, we kind of, uh, we had three kids without these things. I don't know why you need it. So, um, that's kind of the, 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 the situation right now. So, let's go a couple, uh, through a couple of facts before we go in the whole sort of world. Let's talk about the current stage of this industry. When I'm talking about this industry, I actually mean blockchain, I mean cryptocurrencies, I mean all of the things that we're doing and we're actually here listening. So here goes. Um, so this is a fact that I invented, but it's still a fact. So the, this is one of the fastest changing industries out there the rate of evolution is absolutely staggering and amazing. So why? Well, the reason for it is that because of all the things that we survived so far, because of electricity, because of computer revolution, because of mobile revolution, because of all of the things that are happening, and the fact that our current system is not functioning the way that we feel that it should function, we are inclined to change it. And we are prone to experimentation. We as a species, we try out a lot of things, a lot of things that break, the fabric of our society or, you know, make it better. So this is one of the fastest changing industries out there, right? Do you agree? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So let's move on. So it is also one of the most innovative ones. So you can argue, no, but AI, machine learning, I don't know, quantum computing, space, uh, electric cars, blah, blah, blah. But this industry is actually pushing the boundaries of everything with this on the screen, but also many more. So tokenization of assets, rethinking value, rethinking ownership, uh, new ways to fund projects, new ways to you know, govern people, um, uh, reaching consensus on a massive scale. So one day may, in the near future, we might have a global voting system that you know, creates this uh, Star Trek um, you know, universe of global federation. What was it called? The Federation of Planets. Uh, by using this kind of technology. So one of the most innovative industries also out there, pushing the boundaries of everything that we uh, are doing right now. And I think that, and I believe that this is one large experiment in disruption. How to screw up the existing system, how to break it and then rebuild it. Why? Because it's not functioning properly. So. This industry is one large experiment in disruption. And I would like to say that um, the whole industry is one big startup. So what does it mean? It means like every startup, it can fail. It can die in flames. But the good thing about startups is when they die, they resurrect immediately in a different form. And when they're resurrected, they have all, all of the learnings from the past dead uh, graveyards embedded in them, in their DNA. So I'm hoping that this kind of cyclical res resurrection dying mechanism is going to continue. But there are a couple of paradoxes. I call, them the, I call it the blockchain paradox. Again, if you Google it, it doesn't exist. I just invented it for this purpose. But one of the things that um, I noticed uh, in the last couple of years is this, that Although things around us in this industry are changing at an alarming rate. So if you start from, let's start with a question. Who read the white paper, Nakamoto's white paper in 2009? 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, so what I'm trying to say is that it starts, it starts, you know, very, very slow. And then when you first read it, you say, oh, wow, this is very cool, you know, academic experiment. Hope it one day, 50 years from now, people will use it in Star Trek and la la la. And then, bam, a couple of years later, things kind of progress. So it is changing. So things that were available or uh, that were actually a fact a year ago do not longer uh, 
function and they're not real world anymore. So although this is happening, still everybody is trying to do one thing. Startups, projects, uh, traders, uh, speculants, they're trying to apply the logic of the old system into this new world and the world that we're trying to build and hope it's going to work. It's going to work out. So at the same time this is happening, we're trying to ignore, that's why it's a paradox, at the same time we're trying to ignore fundamental rules of life and business and thinking they don't apply to us and hoping we're going to survive. So everything is changing. We're saying yes, but this is how it works. The technical analysis is, you know, correlating with the cryptocurrencies at the same time that it's working here. And then we hope it's not going to happen. It's going to continue, you know, rising forever. And, you know, then we cry like we cried in the last couple of months. Um, so, <laughs> and another thing is happening again, a paradox that everyone, although all of this framing that I, that I said, it's in all of your heads, you know this instinctively, but although everybody knows it's true, everybody's trying to build a decentralized version of an existing platform. So, or trying to figure out a way to decentralize everything around us. Let's build a decentralized consum. Let's try to build a decentralized Facebook, decentralized Uber, decentralized bank, decentralized this, decentralized that. And it's becoming um, a little bit more, uh, a little bit, uh, uh, you know, what's a cargo cult? A cargo cult is this. So it's, I think it was during the Second World War, some Polynesian islands somewhere far away in this middle of the ocean. And I think the American fleet was invading Japan. And then, you know, they went on this small island. They built an airstrip where the, the you know, the, the, the cargo trains would uh, land. And then the war ended and they were gone. And you have the natives still believing in this holy god of U.S. Air Force that comes periodically and brings gifts. So they build airstrips, they make it clean, they light fires and they make airplanes out of straw, hoping they're going to come back. And they, you know, so we're doing because it is good at one for one thing, we think it's good for everything. And we're trying to apply that for whatever we see around us. So, you know, we're trying to blockchainify everything around us and not everything should be uh, put in blockchain. Uh, so. Again, fast forwarding a little bit. So this brings us to the topic du jour that, you know, Lambos and Moons were one of the reasons why a lot of people went into this place, uh, into this industry, but that's fine. So, but what happened is that a lot of ICO backed projects or token backed pro projects fundraised a lot of money, um, massive, massive amounts of money, which were usually reserved. And I'm coming from this space for companies who have customers, revenues, stable products, stable product market fit, and they did it only with a presentation, a white paper or a website. Again, a cargo cult. So you still have, for, to this day, you have, go online and you search for ICO 2019, you will still find some stupid schmucks trying to do the same thing with the same rules that they think you know, are still present and alive. And again, that's fine because nobody in this room believes them. Maybe, you know, people who fall on, I don't know, OneCoin or BitConnect still fall for these, uh, for these kind of things, but this is how the industry evolves a little bit. So this brings me to the next topic. So 90% of the startups fail. That's a fact. It's not statistics, it's a fact. So 90% of every new venture which falls into the category of startup fails. You know what is the rate for blockchain startups? Or crypto startups? <laughs> eh, we still don't know. <laughs> because this is the rate. So uh, only 10% of startups, funded startups, whatever startups, survive the first three years of their life. Only 10%. Blockchain. So if we take the, let's say, cutoff, we, I would say that it starts in the blockchain space in a kosher way. 2014, 2013 and 2014. I would say that one of the first startups, again, this is my interpretation, is Ethereum. 2014, am I right? 2014, right? 15. 14, they did an ICO in ICO. They did a crowd sale in 2014. So 15, 16, 17, 18, okay, so they're one. And then there's 1,000 of them, you know, coming 
um, after them. So if 90% 90, 90 of all startups fail, the, in the blockchain space, it is you know, even, even worse. And the reason, these are the main reasons that apply for a normal startup space. So, and you can ask anyone from this, uh, from this group, from this industry, these are the main reasons. And still, although it's very well known, people are an optimistic beings and they say, yeah, but this is not gonna apply to me. So I guess there is, you know, in this room, there's at least five people who are thinking, yeah, you know, smart, very cute, you know, presentation, but no, it's like, I don't need market. I know that this is true. So no market need, uh, not the right team to build this, um, lack of business model and lack of discipline, fundamental rules. This is like the holy scripture of the startup space. So if you do these things, if you think these things and behave in such a way, you, you know, you can go and bet some money that you're going to fail within the first three years. So how do we fix that? So what's the, what's the, um, what's the way to circumvent this? So let's start with no market need. So I call it also, there is no use for blockchain. So in my one and a half years in the blockchain space as an investor, as someone who's trying to help build these things. So I saw so many startups, projects force, you know, blockchain cryptocurrencies on their products. I cannot even count them. I, I used to have an Excel, you know, it's like the shit list and the good list. The shit list was, yes, they don't know what blockchain is. They don't know what crypto is, but you know, they want to um, apply it here. So again, trying to build a decentralized version of an existing system just because it's decentralized. In small number of cases, this is actually true. In majority of the cases, this is just adding additional complexity, unnecessary complexity, and does not follow the fundamental rules of what blockchain, permissionless blockchain, the true kosher word of blockchain actually means. So, and they do this because they got funded, because they put a website and some pictures there. Oh, this is my advisor, this is my investor, this is my blockchain architect, la la la. There's this joke that we, uh, uh, meme that we send of this guy who, who you know, took a picture in four different ways, like with his, his head tied, with his, you know, head um, hair flying around. He's the blockchain developer, he is the business guy, he is the designer. So um, the first thing you, should do in order to avoid this, you should start without the outside funding. So you should build something and test the market first. Test to see if there is a need for blockchain in this uh, exact thing. If there is a need not only for blockchain, but for that kind of a product and for that particular solution that you're trying to build and, you know, do, I don't know, Facebook for cats, does it really need a coin of its own? just to use it. So if there is no use for blockchain, if there is no market, you are 100% going to die. No matter how, you know, hyped the bull or bull market it is, eventually you're going to die. Second one, one of my favorites, lack of proper business model. For all of you who were yesterday on Alvaro's presentation, this is one of his topics. So finding a business model in an open source project, in a blockchain, project is super hard. It's hard even as a startup, but it's even harder when you're trying to use, you know, complex, heavy technology as this is. So, you know, that's one of the things that the first thing that you should try to look for is how are you going to find the business model. So you should find, so the ways to circumvent this is to try to find the business model first before start building. And if you can't find it, then at least find and create a funnel of funding of some sort so it can sustain you until you actually reach that point. So you have one goal as a startup, as someone building a project, your goal is to survive as long as it takes for you to create a sustainable project. And it's usually two ways. There's no lot of, you know, you either have revenues or you have investors capital. Investors capital is, I don't know, mom and dad from across the world who invested 50 bucks in your ICO or STO or whatever, or, you know, or you have enough customers to sustain you and you can survive from their, from their, uh, from that taking. So 
if there's not a lot of evidence for either, you're gonna probably die and it doesn't make sense to build that blockchain Facebook for cats or dogs. Uh, this is one kind of um, self-fulfilling, uh, let's call it like this a little bit, so it's, it, it, it's counterintuitive. So um, there is no such thing as a self-made self man. Whenever you read that Kim Kardashian is a self-made billionaire, you say bullshit because that's not true. There is not, no such thing. And there is even less evidence of self-made companies. Companies, organizations, DAOs, whatever you want to call them, they're made of people. And, you know, that's the whole thing behind it. So people, you should make sure that you have the right people with the right mentality, with the right skill set and mindset before you start, before you fundraise, before you build. Why? Because, you know, the right people for the right reasons. That's my favorite, favorite term. Um, well, when things become hard, the only thing that's going to save you is not blockchain. It's not the holy Satoshi Nakamoto. It is the people. Um, and you're going to survive only because of those people. I'll give you an illustration. This is one of the things that I'm saying everyone, all of my startups. So when you don't have money and you have a problem, you know, you use all of your, your and your team's strength, smarts, you know, skills to solve that problem. But when you have a, a lot of money and a problem, the first thing you do is you throw a lot of money on that problem and you hope it's going to disappear. And then the money goes out and then you're dead. So don't do that. Um, the last one is lack of discipline. And this is very hard. I am the worst guy, you know, to show you the lack of discipline. But somehow in these cases, I have. I never go to gym. I smoke for 25 years. I drink like 10 coffees a day. But in this case is to turn a really interesting idea in a really cutting edge technology into something, into a company or a movement that can innovate and exist for years, decades. It takes a lot of discipline and a lot of disciplines. So without it, innovation, creativity, breakthrough ideas, everything goes to waste. So all organizations of any sort need to improve at every step of the way. And if they don't do this, they just die out eventually. So they either put importance on tech, you have this, you see this everywhere. So tech is important, marketing sucks, business, remove them from our premises or the other way around. You have EOS who was created on exclusively on hype. You have on the other side, you have, I don't know, Ethereum, which is, you know, the code is the law. And these are the two. So I haven't seen one so far that has a healthy amount of each of them. And hopefully in the next couple of years, we're going we're gonna to find it. So these were the four rules before I conclude, because I know I'm, I'm done. Um, you know what this is? Come on, it's a pyramid. Uh, so pyramids, you know, you know when they were built, right? 15,000 years ago, right? No, 5,000. Five, 5,000 years ago, a lot of time. 5,000 years ago, so something that humans built 5,000 years ago is still standing. It's ugly, but it's still standing. So. Egyptians or whoever built it, aliens, what kind of tools did they have? Alien. Aliens. <laughs> so they had, I don't know, bulldozers, dynamite, lasers, right? No. They have this, exactly. And they had math. So it is never about the tools. Nobody's going to ask us, oh, what kind of tools did you have? Did you have crypto cryptographic algorithms or did you have artificial intelligence that helped you build this, you know, trustless, censorship resistant, automatic, autonomous society? Nobody's going to ask you this. It's never about the tools. It is what you do with the tools that you currently have and what you build it. So it's our job right now to see and figure out if we're going to build all of us, because all of us are part of that system whether we think it or not. So are we going to build something that is going to hold for 5,000 years or not? I know I'm going to try by not applying these four, four things. So thank you very much. That concludes my presentation.
If you have any questions, I'm here. Are we done? Yep. Now we have a break, but if you have any questions, you can grab me on the coffee on, on your way out. Thanks for being a lovely audience.